Some skeptics say that information really has nothing to do with fundamental science. It's just a convenient way for human beings to package certain states of matter, and that ultimately all that matters is the uh, underlying laws of physics, that information really doesn't do stuff, doesn't matter. Uh, I think most people here would not agree with that. We're here because we think information does matter, and I wanted to just start the ball rolling by showing this slide. The, uh, the top, this uh, is a, in case you don't recognize it, is a, a nucleotide sequence from a portion of DNA that codes for the protein cytochrome C. Uh, the human, did I, somebody object to that? Sorry. Uh, the, so the top one is human cytochrome C, and the bottom one, which looks identical, is uh, not identical because I deliberately on the PowerPoint slide transposed the uh, two uh, letters A and T there. Uh, and my point here is simply that if a cell, human cell, has the top sequence, it's a healthy cell, it has the bottom sequence, it will die. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm, it sounds plausible. <laughs> but you get the point that uh, you can't tell by looking what the consequences are going to be. So that's because this nucleotide sequence carries information which, in fact, it carries instructions, information which make a difference uh, on a large scale, the scale of cells and organisms. Uh, so information does matter. Uh, but trying to understand the relationship between the information and its causal powers and the matter in which that information is instantiated and its causal powers is part of the task that we have before us. That's all I really wanted to say, just to get uh, our brains in gear. When we first got the email about this panel, we were asked to, we were, to given our, our concept, to define it, explain it, and say something provocative in five minutes. Um, and what I'm going to do then is I'm going to start with the provocative thing. I'm going to say something that sounds outrageous. And then um, I'm going to qualify it a bit and tell you what I really mean. And hopefully by the end of it, everyone's going to be going, yeah, I always knew that. That's exactly how I've always thought about entropy. Okay, so the, the really provocative thing I was going to say is that entropy doesn't exist. By which it mean, I mean the, the entropy we ascribe to a system is not an intrinsic property of the system, but has to do with something else, something having to do with us. The slightly less provocative way of putting that is entropy is in the eye of the beholder. But what I really mean is entropy is a means relative concept. Now what do I mean by that? Well, let me just give you examples of means relative co concepts visible. If I tell you something's visible, I'm telling you something about the physical properties of the thing. But if you ask whether something is visible, you know, you can ask, what do you got? What means do you have to see it, to perceive it? Or controllable. Controllable, you know, wh whether certain parameters of a system are controllable, has to do not in part with the physical properties of the, the system and those parameters, but also in part with you know, our abilities to, you know, to manipulate. Now, you might say, okay, wait, you know, there's no way entropy could be something like that. But think about the standard thermodynamic um, definition of entropy when it's introduced in your intro thermodynamics course. Yeah, so we introduce uh, uh, entropy, the entropy difference between two equilibrium states is you connect them by some quasi-static reversible process and it's the integral from, from one state to the other, dq over t, which sounds, okay, that's just physics, that's got nothing to do with us. Next slide, please. Um, but that definition um, had that dq in it. dq is an increment of heat. Um, in the old days, you know, back when, um, yeah, uh, um, be before the kinetic theory of gases really, really took off, if you thought of, of heat as a separate substance, caloric, then when you're transferring heat to, to, um, from one system to another, it's completely unambiguous how much it is. Now, we don't think like that anymore. 
Heat is just one mode of energy transfer, and in thermodynamics we distinguish between energy transfer by heating and energy transfer as work. And what is the difference? Well, here's um, a, um, a lovely picture from a nice popular book about thermodynamics. Um, in one case, we've got a piston pushing on a gas. We're doing work. Everything is going in a nice orderly manner. Um, and, but, uh, um, and you're transferring energy in a certain way to the system. When you're heating it, you're still transferring energy. You're still changing the motion of the molecules, but you're doing it in a sort of higgledy-piggledy way. And um, that suggests the difference between heat transfer, one metal shit. The difference between tra heat transfer and, um, and doing work has to do with what we can keep track of. And here is one of the founders of statistical mechanics, one of my favorite philosophers of physics. Available energy is energy we can direct into any desired channel. Dissipated energy is energy we cannot lay hold of and direct at pleasure, such as the energy of the confused agitation of molecules we call heat. So the difference between heat transfer and um, doing work ha has to do with what we can keep track of and, and what we can't. And that is integral to the definition of entropy. I was also asked to say something about Boltzmann entropy. You might say, okay, no, that is completely objective. Um, but Boltzmann entropy of a system, you take the phase space or you take an energy surface of the phase space, you partition it into macro states. And then the Boltzmann entropy of a matter state is proportional to the logarithm of the phase phase volume of it. Well, that partition into macro states, what is that? Well, you choose a set of parameters, which are typically the ones that we can ascertain and measure by feasible means. And a macro state is, you know, a, a, um, is a set of states that are, uh, micro states that are, uh, um, macroscopically indistinguishable, we share the values of those things. So there, you know, even though we don't um, ordinarily think of it that way, you know, there are means relative concepts even into the definition of Boltzmann entropy. Yeah, you're basically taking, you know, there's a whole universe, right? And then, but then you take a subsystem and say, that's the one that I'm gonna manipulate and control and, it, it, and any, anything out in the environment is, is lost to me. Yeah, that's the idea. Perfect. Yeah, Sean. Thanks. I think I agree, you know, at the strictly speaking level with everything that you said, but uh, one thing worth pointing out about this last example, the Boltzmann entropy, is that yes, we need to choose a coarse graining, but that choice is not completely arbitrary in the, in the real world. When we look at the air in this room, uh, it's not as if different people experience different aspects of the classical microstate, of the statinic microstate. You know, some of us see the momentum of every molecule and some of us right. see the positions or anything. Even if you had a robot, it would see the same macroscopic observables because those are the ones that the low energy phenomena give us, and that's set by the laws of physics as much as anything else. So it's not completely arbitrary. There are good reasons to choose some coarse graining rather than others. Right. Thank you, yes, I agree entirely, and that's a very important thing to say. And that's why um, I think that it's easy us to forget that there is this mean re relative um, aspect to it because, you know, um, First of all, things that we matter aren't going to be too terribly sensitive to the exact details of, uh, uh, of, of, of the definition. And also, you know, the sorts of things, that the, the gap, gap between the, you know, the molecular level and the macroscopics that is, is so big that, you know, there's the sorts of things that are going to be you know, readily ascertainable and manipulable by us or any kind of being and at all remotely like us or the sort in, in plausibly that any sort of being that could be, you know, an agent manipulating, observing and manipulating the world. Yeah. Last question, we'll come in. So I, I think the important question to ask is not whether uh, these choices are arbitrary, but the question is to ask why do these arbitrary choices have physical consequences? Right, I mean, this is, this is what you're pointing at, this is what you're pointing at. It, you, there are reasons that those choices, those particular course gradings have physical consequences. This goes to the point that I think Paul made at the beginning, is how and why can information do anything if how we define it is defined in what seems like an interdependent way. 
we'll have to move on to Carlo, please. Car Carlo Rivelli. <coughs> so far we've kept the time, but we have to be strict. Um, Ray asked a wonderful question and a challenge by pointing out subjectivity in, uh, in fact, in information. Um, I'm going to try to give an answer to that, and in fact, to some extent, challenge this uh, subjectivity. I think that uh, information. I think that information is um, a little bit like energy in the 19th century. There was a moment in which energy uh, appeared to be enormously important in physics, but at the same time, it seemed something a little bit spiritualistic, non-physical, mysterious, uh, subjective. Uh, and uh, this was the time of Helmholtz, right in Germany. There. Um, and slowly it turned out that energy is enormously important in physics, but it's nothing to do with subjectivity, anything like that. Um, information is coming all over. Um, it's in, of course, in, uh, uh, in uh, thermodynamical entropy, in consciousness, uh, in biology. This is my preferred example. In quantum mechanics, you can show uh, that the full formulas of quantum mechanics derives, uh, can be derived from uh, uh, these two postulates that uh, there's a finite amount of information in any physical system, with some details, and uh, uh, in spite of that, you can always acquire new information about the system interacting with it. So the question is, what is this information? What sort of information are we talking about? And that's what this two minutes are, uh, two remaining minutes are about. I think that a clear answer to the question raised by uh, Ray is was given by Shannon in his founding work on information in the uh, late 40s uh, by giving a definition of information which is, is explicit in his text. It has nothing to do with subjectivity, it has nothing to do with choices. He was an engineer working on telephone lines. He wanted to compute how much stuff a telephone line brings. And uh, for us, uh, um, the good definition, the, the, the good concept is relative information. So information for Shannon is just a number of the configuration which a system can be. In fact, logarithm base two, if you want to. Um, but the interesting thing is relative information. So relative information is this thing here. Suppose you have a stick with two sides, if you, uh, two dots black. If you flip it, it's uh, white. So upstairs, you have two possible colors. Downstairs, you have two possible colors. Uh, two by two is four, so you have four possible configuration of the colors, but the up and the down are constrained by some physics, okay, the rigidity of the stick. So the total number of configuration is not two by two, but is less. It's two by two minus, uh, uh, it, it is two, in fact. So it's not four, but two. So this difference is the relative information that the up has with respect to the down. In this sense, there is a notion of information which is completely physical, has nothing to do with subjectivity, has nothing to do with... Uh, um, it's true that the air of this uh, room has a entropy that depends on the coarse graining, but this coarse graining is uniquely determined by the interaction of a system, me or a thermometer or whatever, with the air. So uh, there's nothing subjective in the property of the entropy relatively to the system interact with, um, the thermometer or me or, or a piston for, uh, for a gas. So the uh, notion of relative, ent uh, relative information uh, by Shannon is uh, uh, non-subjective and uh, captures what uh, uh, couples of systems know about one another, what information they have about one another, um, and I believe that this is a good starting point for talking about information in biology, in thermodynamics, in gravity, in quantum gravity. I will talk about quantum gravity in the, uh, I think, the last day. And perhaps even, oh, one minute, I still have a lot of time. I thought there was a minute. Um, <laughs> and perhaps even in, uh, in uh, uh, subject. I use the last minute for this. Uh, I love Democritus. Democritus is this ancient, uh, so it's sort of basic of our view of the world. He, he had this vision of the world. There was nothing else than a lot of atoms flying around. However, sets of atoms are constrained by the... And Democritus uses uh, his metaphor that uh, the order in which atoms are lied uh, is like a language. 
and your slide seems out of Democritus exactly. So the world is not just a set of atoms moving or a set of fields moving, but is also the relative information of systems that systems have with respect to one another because of the physical constraint that tie one to the other. And if you think about it, every time we, think, we, we talk about information, we really talk about that. The information we have uh, is a relation, is a constraint because what's happening in our head and what is outside. The thermodynamical information is a constraint, a lot of constraint between the measuring apparatus, the thermometer, and the uh, state of the gas. And I believe that quantum mechanics also is entirely a story about uh, um, the uh, constraint that uh, uh, between two systems that have interacted, we use uh, measurement. So um, that's my conclusion. Uh, the world is not just a blind wind of atoms or a set of fields. It's also the infinite game of mirrors reflecting one another formed by the relative information exchanged uh, among uh, the structures formed by a subset of these uh, atoms or whatever. Thank you. We need to uh, stay. Don't go away, uh, because we have a discussion time. It's now down to three minutes. Question at the back there. Thank you for these, these very interesting perspectives. I want, just to, so we don't agree too much, I just wanted to make a controversial statement, sort of disagreeing a little bit with what Sean said and, and you said, and agreeing a bit more with what uh, Wayne said. Uh, about, so if you look at the state of the air in this, of the quarks in this room, it was claimed that every, reasonable, every observer would agree on what the entropy is of the air in this room, and I actually think that's not true, and I'm gonna blame you, Alan Guth, for that, because you, Alan has told us that the origin ultimately of all the structure here was quantum fluctuations during inflation, so the total state, the wave function of, of everything here, can actually have a superposition of the Earth oriented like it is now, and the Earth a little bit rotated, in which case there's just water here and a bunch of fish, because this is actually part of the Caribbean. So if you now ask, what is the entropy of all these quarks in this particular spatial volume? It depends on whether you're in the branch of the wave function where it's air, or range is air, or in the part of the wave function where it's range is water. And um, if there is an observer in each branch of the wave function, you know, they will actually disagree. And in that extent, in that sense, it's like Wayne said, that the entropy they will ascribe to this volume here is actually dependent some Observer dependent. Um, Max, I appreciate your, your, your desire to disagree, but I think we do agree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, because I'm not claiming, not at all, that the entropy of the air is objectively defined. I'm claiming that the entropy of the air, with respect indexical to some observer or to some branch or to something, is uh, objectively defined. So, in fact, the entropy you use uh, when you divide the world in three, and uh, that's exactly the entropy you're talking about. Also, the von Neumann entropy has the same property. Yeah. So, I think we do agree. Yeah, a quick follow-up. It, it, it struck me that what you're doing is making Wayne's insight more precise. Uh, in that the philosopher for, for exactly no for exactly the reason you just said right because you, you're making what, what you're talking about is relative entropy and the observer uh, depend, your, the choice of observer changes the choice of uh, the uh, measure of the uh, relative entropy so it's subjective in that sense in the sense that Wayne was getting at yes uh, but by observer I would uh, not think of anything special as observer I mean it's uh, it's any other physical system that interact with a gas uh, if the ob if if the ob if I have the gas and uh, a system that interacts with the gas with a piston and a thermometer the handle of a thermometer uh, then uh, there are two variables of the gas microscopic variables that affect these other systems so with respect to this other system the coarse graining is uniquely defined by the interaction right good so it's more general so I agree with you but uh, I would take away um, the feeling of subjectivity. Uh, uh, that comes from giving observer this funny name that seems to imply that it has eyes, it has a brain, it has memory, it has all that. So any two system interacting, I think, determine a cross grain. Sure. Yeah. Okay, we have to move on, I'm afraid. It's uh, Livia Lombardi as our next victim. I was asked to say something uh, about something provocative. 
So I think that the most provocative thing is to pose questions. So I will ask questions to you. In general, there are two views about information. According to semantic view, A has information about B if A means or represents B, where B is the content of information. Uh, the question here for philosopher is, what is new here with respect to the traditional discussions about meaning and representation? Nevertheless, in physics, we are not interested in this view, but in the so-called statistical view or mathematical view, according to which information is what is described by the Shannon or now the Schumacher theory. But is agreement about the formalism sufficient for agreement about the interpretation? At present, it is fashionable to say, at least in the philosopher community, to say that information, the word information, is an abstract noun. And this is because what is transmitted in communication is a type, not a token. This is strange because I, I know how to measure information, but I don't know how to measure a type. What is the quantity of a type? So we are said that uh, since information is an abstract noun, information is not a substance, it's not a material entity, not part of the spatial temporal content of the world. The question is, is it legitimate to equate substantial, material, spatial, temporal, and physical? Well, anyway, we are said here what information is not, but I'm interested in what information is. So, according to some, information is something that supplies knowledge. This epistemic interpretation is usually applied in cognitive science and in philosophy. On the other hand, physicists and engineers, on the contrary, ad adopt a physical interpretation. Information is a physical item transmitted by physical interactions and by carrier signals. In the discussion about how information has to be interpreted, these two views are considered competing. But are they? Perhaps we can adopt an informal interpretation according to which the theory of information is a mathematical theory, a chapter of the theory of probability, and as such, it has multiple interpretations, as infinitesimal calculus, each one useful in a certain field. So, the epistemic and the physical interpretations, also non-competing, are clearly different. If there is no interaction or signal between source and receiver, there is no physical information. We cannot define a physical uh, channel between them. Well, this was clear before considering quantum mechanics, which has always come to cause problems to us. For instance, in quantum teleportation, there is neither interaction or carrier. So the question is, are these two interpretations really as different as supposed? And this leads us to the question about quantum information. It can be said that it is what is described by, by Schumacher theory, but if we read carefully Schumacher's paper, we see that he talks about the standard search whose outputs are codified by means of quantum states. So, are we talking of quantum information or of quantum codification of information. On the other hand, we may say that information is quantum because codified by non-orthogonal states. But non-orthogonal states are always quantum states? Or perhaps information is quantum when assisted by entanglement, like in teleportation. So we are said that Alice sent to Bob much more information than the two bits sent through the classical channel. But how much information? How to compute the quantity of information set in teleportation? And sometimes I ask myself, what is the technical concept of information 
in entanglement of system communication. Well, like can you see, I have many questions uh, to discuss with you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Everybody agrees. Oh, everybody agrees. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, it seems to me that uh, you are, uh, if I understand uh, correctly your point, you are uh, distinguishing between um, this epistemic and uh, physical notion of information, but uh, and. Um, if uh, in, uh, in uh, um, quantum mechanics uh, we think uh, about uh, material, ob uh, ma ma not a material object, but uh, as uh, the only on uh, ontological object uh, with, uh, that exists uh, as uh, uh, the events, the measurement, so and with measurement the, the, um, the instant in which we, have, we acquire new information. And, uh, Nothing else exists, uh, only this. Uh, isn't this a possible uh, way to reconcile uh, the, the new, the, the two uh, point of view that you were proposing? I think that now the challenge is try to find a sense of information that uh, it's uh, uh, proper to quantum mechanics. But regarding what you said, you said that there is there are events, only events, and that you have to find information between the, the, those events. Cor I mean, when you said that, that you are supposing uh, uh, some interpretation of quantum mechanics, and now mm, many people try to make an interpretation, of, an informational interpretation of quantum mechanics, but my point <coughs> here is that uh, we need to know what information is before, because if you don't make that, you are uh, assigning quantum mechanics uh, to quantum mechanics the interpretation of the information you previously previously have. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking about it. Uh, David Bohm has this concept, and this applies to all the panels so far. David Bohm has this concept of active information. And uh, we heard about relative information and other kinds of information. And um, uh, I think it's worth thinking about how does active information uh, compare to these other kinds of information? And at the end of the day, we need a definition of information that's robust, that takes into account all these kinds of uh, types of information. So as we continue in this conference, I, th I hope we can try to come to a definition that is that kind of transcends all these sub types of information. Well, from the first part is that I don't know the, the notion, Bond's notion, so I can say nothing. And uh, regarding the, the the possibility of giving uh, all embracing concept of information, my question is is, is if re we really need it. I mean, if we can, perhaps we can take a formal. Uh, view with different interpretations, like any formal theory, like in mathematics, like uh, uh, infinitesimal calculus. You have the, the structure, the mathematical structure, and it depends where you apply it, you will have different interpretations of the notion. Okay, thank you. Thank we you. must move on. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, Kevin Knuth. I'm going to, to, to talk a little bit about foundations um, because I think that this is, this is an important matter and, and, and sometimes is, is overlooked or taken a little lightly. Um, foundations matter. Um, a good foundation forms a broad base on which theories can be constructed. Um, narrow foundations limit your perspective and scope. And so here's some examples. Um, probability theory has a few foundations, Kolmogorov in 1933. Um, talks about probability as measures on sets of events. Dave Finetti talks about consistent betting. Um, Cox talks about generalizations of Boolean logic to degrees of belief. Um, these are all very different perspectives in probability theory. Um, 
you have a similar um, situation with entropy and information. You have Boltzmann, which talks about entropy in terms of combinatorics. Um, Gibbs thinks about thermodynamic or statistical entropy. Shannon talks about communication channels. And um, selecting any one of these can sometimes limit your perspective. I'm going to give an example of why we might um, do better thinking a little more generally. <coughs> so here's some clues to a broader context. Here's a, here's a nice pattern. The first line is the sum rule from probability theory, which most of you probably recognize. The, the second line is the, is the um, definition of mutual information. Um, if you go further, you see a pattern starts to form. And to some of you, this might not be a surprise. Um, if you take two rectangular polytopes and kind of cram them together, the, the surface area or volume or um, length is going to be the area of the set union, um, is going to be the sum of the two areas minus the intersection. Um, the next one's my favorite rule. Um, the maximum of two numbers is the sum of the numbers minus the minimum, right? These, these look all, all um, very similar. Um, however, if you were to say choose De Finetti's um, foundational probability theory and use this to derive the sum rule for probability theory, you, you're missing out on deriving all these other rules, right? So you've missed something. Um, it's, not, it's too narrow of a foundation. Um, a nice quote from James kind of sums this up. Um, well, there was a bit of a, for a while there was a bit of a uh, confusion um, with mutual information where people were trying to derive the, the rule for mutual information directly from the sum rule for probability. It looks similar. They should come from each other somehow. Um, but James points out that the essential content does not lie in the equations. Instead, it lies in the ideas that lead to those equations. Um, and one thing you can do is if you consider um, order theory, and consider quantification of order theoretic um, constructs, um, consistent quantification, you can find that these relations all derive from associativity. So it's something much more general is going on. <coughs> Minute and a half. I'm not going to go through details here, but on the, on the left is, is what we would call a Boolean lattice of, of logical statements. Um, so you could have an apple, a banana, or a cherry, and I can quantify um, this Boolean lattice with probabilities. Um, you can also construct sets of, of statements, and this leads to a structure on the right that is a, is a nice representation of questions. And you can actually derive that the, um, that the quantities on the right, if you enforce that they are somehow dependent on the ones on the left, and there's some details there, um, are related to entropy and information. So the degree to which, from this picture, the degree to which one statement implies another is related to probabilities. And on the right, the degree to which one question answers another is related to information. And I think something like this is, is very nice and, and a bit more general. And, and maybe um, thinking a little more broadly is what's needed. Questions? Yeah. Can you uh, <coughs> talk to mutual information and this whole concept of physical Yeah, well, mutual, mutual information is often thought of the, the amount of information that two, that two, sub, two systems share. Um, here, here in this picture, it, it turns out to be related to um, the, the or of two questions. Um, and so, yeah, so the probability that you have an apple or a cherry can be, can be written as a, as a sum of the probabilities that you have an apple and the probabilities you have a cherry, and this probability here is zero. Um, whereas here, I can talk about the, um, the question, um, is it an apple or not an apple, is, is then related to the, 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 the questions below it. This, is a, this actually, this structure here is a little deficit. It's not big enough to include a lot of things we'd like to talk about. But, but you can um, quantify questions this way in a, in a, within, with a calculus that's very similar to probability calculus. And it turns out that's related to information theory. So information seems to be related to um, answering questions, which is very observer dependent again and very subjective. Yes. So do you have a favorite foundation then for probability theory that's, I mean, you 
said oh, I, 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 well, I've come to like I've come to like this one more. I, I, I started out being interested in Cox's ter um, ideas about probability and degrees of belief, but um, my my friend um, and colleague Jeff Scargill once asked, once asked a question. He said, it, um, from a very practical standpoint, if I'm going to use Bay Bayesian probability theory to um, assign a probability to a, a model that I know is an approximation to a physical, a real system. So I know that the model's not correct. Um, how can probability represent my degree of belief that it's true? And how, can it, how could it possibly represent that it's true? I can't do either. And so, so what I think, the way I like to think about probability is, is the probability is more related to the degree to which one statement implies another. <clears throat> so the statement that um, it is either an apple, banana, or a cherry, the degree to which that implies that it's an apple is what you're actually calculating. And that actually takes you away from the subjectivity bit. <clears throat> One more question. Then. Do you have a uh, quantum version of this? Because uh, Feynman emphasized that uh, the probability, the meaning of the way to calculate probability is different from the classic probability. We need to have amplitudes, and then we add amplitudes and absolutely square, and we get probability. Again, you can, you can actually um, look at partially ordered sets of quantum um, experimental setups or measurement sequences and show that associativity gives you the sum rule for, for um, amplitudes. Um, so we have some papers with Philip Goyal listed down at the bottom that do this. And, and in this picture, quantum mechanics allows you to assign probabilities. Probability theory doesn't say anything about assigning probabilities. It tells you how to manipulate them, whereas working with amplitudes allows you to assign them. So. All right. Well, look, thank you very much. We must move on. Our next speaker is Joss Affink. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think, personally, that the word information is somewhat overused and that uh, in spite of the fact that one might consider mathematical definitions of information, one should not necessarily assume that there is just one single concept underlying all of that. Um, and uh, I want to, well, I'll, I'll just talk about two expressions. I'll, I'll compare the, the Shannon information with uh, the Fisher information. I'll probably skip most of the classical and quantum applications of that. Uh, so, if I can have the, yes, thank you. Uh, we have been, become accustomed to the idea that information can be quantified quite irrespective of its semantic meaning, so that you can go to a computer store and ask for a USB stick that has, I don't know how many megabytes on it, and you can store information on that regardless of whether it's Shakespeare complete works or the human genome or what. So the question about the meaning of information can somehow be decoupled from the question of how much information is there. Still, if you arrive at an airport and you see a desk over there saying information, uh, you're not going to go there and say, can I have 10 kilobytes, please? <laughs> um, you want to learn something over there. You probably want to know something about the arrival or the departure times of airplanes. And so, so it is in physics too. I mean, regardless of whether we, we consider information to be subjective or objective, we typically have some type of task at hand. Uh, we have a goal, as, as I think Wayne wanted to, uh, to emphasize. And a, a, a typical task that is very common is that we want to predict the value of some uh, observable quantity. We have a, or an event or an outcome of an experiment. And in many cases in physics, we are describing the state of a system by some probability distribution. And then we can simply ask ourselves, given that probability distribution, how easy is it to predict the value uh, of the observable we're interested in. Now, Shannon's information is very useful for that uh, purpose. It's a uh, functional which can be defined in terms of that probability distribution. 
So once you know the observable, once you know the probability distribution, the information is a fixed, objectively defined number. Uh, does it have subjective aspects? Well, that depends, amongst other things, about your in interpretation of probability. There are subjective interpretations of probability, there are objective interpretations of probability. And depending on which one you choose, the, in the Shannon information might come out to be a subjective or an objective quantity. Still, it's only one particular type of information. It's the information about the outcome of an experiment or the value of an observable. Can I have the next one? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll skip that. Uh, it's, it can be useful, for example, in quantifying uncertainty relations. That's just a footnote. Uh, there are other types of questions you might consider doing physics or doing statistics, either classical or quantum. For example, you might not be completely <coughs> in full knowledge about the state of the system. And so you ask yourself, can I learn something about this unknown state of my system by making observations? That's the purpose of the Fisher information. And the way people go about it is to assume that your unknown state is part of some family that can be parameterized by some parameter theta. And you want to know how easy it is to distinguish various values of theta uh, in this family. And uh, as you can see from the bottom, that's the definition of the Fisher information. It is not, like Shannon's, a functional on a given probability distribution. It depends on a given family of probability distributions parameterized by theta. And it will change its value when you change the parameterization. Still, uh, can I have the next slide? There are various reasons of why it is important uh, in, in statistical inference in many different approaches. Here I simply sketched a most familiar approach to statistical inference called point estimation theory, in which case you would think of some statistic, an estimator of the unknown parameter theta. The estimator is called tau here. And in case <coughs> that estimator is unbiased, uh, it's considered to be more effective or more accurate if the variance is smaller. And lo and behold, there is a famous inequality in classical statistics, which is on the next <coughs> slide, the Kramer-Rao inequality, which says that there is a bound on any estimator you might choose for that parameter theta, which is given by the Fisher information. And therefore, this Fisher information gives us a sort of intrinsic accuracy, to use Fisher's own word, about how easy it is to estimate that parameter theta. There are many more uh, aspects in which the Fisher information turns up, but I guess I'll have to leave it here. And I want to show, this is a completely different notion of information because it tries to answer a different question than the Shannon information. Thank you. Two or three minutes now for questions before the last speaker of the first half. Is there a way, <coughs> at least mathematically, to reduce one to the other in some form or not? Are there really? No, they're independent because one is just is, is a functional on a given probability distribution. The other is depends on a parameter on, on a whole family, on, on a whole curve of different probability distributions. It's not fixed by just one probability distribution. Uh, still, there are relations, of course, and, and one of the interesting relations is that if you have um, the relative information, um, which is not a function on one probability distribution, but on two, and if those two probability distributions are members of a, uh, a given family, and if they're very close together, then the Fisher information is just uh, 
up to second order, uh, the increment in the, the coolback Leitner or relative information. Uh, that's an important relation between them. But channel information and fissure information are completely independent. Just one more question or comment. Yep. What are the applications of uh, uh, fissures, uh, information physics, or in other fields? We know that uh, Shenlong's uh, information actually is uh, used in physics as entropy. Yes. What, what was the whole book, isn't there? Oh, physics oh. from Fisher to Oh, oh yes. Okay. Well, I, I, I examples. Oh, oh, one example. I would not like to advertise that book. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, Roy Frieden has is is some some view in which Fisher information magically and mysteriously implies all of physics including the Schrodinger equation and the Maxwell equations. I don't think that's, uh, <laughs> that's something I would buy into. But, but that, 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 is not, that is not to say that fissure information is not a purely a, a, a bona fide and legitimate and, and useful concept. All right. Thank you. I think that's a good uh, time to move on to our last speaker, Steve Giddings. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly will be controversial here, but I'm going to start with a hypothesis that the universe is governed by the principles of quantum mechanics. Uh, the reason for that is, although people try to modify quantum mechanics, it's very hard to sensibly do so. And so that's what I'll take as a starting point. And from that, I will make the statement that the most basic information is quantum information. And what we'd like to do to uh, elaborate on that is say a little bit more how to get a handle on quantum information. So how do we quantify it? Well, for example, quantum information is something that, uh, as a result of unitary evolution in quantum mechanics, is a conserved thing. And the statement of conservation of quantum information is the statement that under quantum evolution, the von Neumann entropy doesn't change. In some sense, that's uh, the mother of all conservation laws in physics, although I won't elaborate on that particular point. But let me define the von Neumann entropy because it plays this important role in explaining uh, or in parameterizing conservation of information. So the definition of the von Neumann uh, entropy is if we start with a uh, density matrix characterizing a quantum system, uh, we can take the trace of uh, minus rho log rho, uh, and that uh, defines the von Neumann entropy. And as an example, if we have a pure quantum state, uh, then that has zero von Neumann entropy. We just have trace of uh, rho times, well, log one, so zero. That is a situation where there's no missing information. Conversely, if you have a density matrix with non-zero von Neumann entropy, then that's a situation where you have missing quantum information. And moreover, if you evolve from the first situation to the second situation, then you've lost quantum information. So quantum information is something we can track with the von Neumann entropy and characterize when it is conserved and when it isn't and uh, see if it's lost. Now, one important aspect of physics is studying the flow and transformation of quantum information. Uh, for example, you can think about transfer of quantum information between subsystems. So let's suppose A and B are two subsystems, and we have a unitary transformation that acts on the uh, state of those combined systems. And we want to know, does that transformation uh, transfer information from system A to system B? And a way to think about that is introduce an auxiliary system, which is a copy of A, a tilde. And let's think about an initial state where we've uh, basically started with some entanglement between the two systems. So in particular, uh, there is an entanglement entropy, a von Neumann entropy of the density matrices uh, we get by tracing out either A or A tilde, uh, which is the log of the dimension of A, say. So this is like, uh, putting yourself in a state where you have a bunch of EPR-like uh, correlations between the two systems, and in fact, uh, that is a precise description of the kind of state I have in mind. 
Uh, so we have entanglement between the two systems. This is an example of entanglement entropy. And we want to know when does information transfer under this unitary evolution from system A to system B. And the short story is that we have transfer of information without loss if uh, after the evolution acts, uh, we have an entanglement entropy between system A tilde and B that is equal to, well, that's the same as the original entanglement between A tilde and A. So in pictures, we transfer the correlations from one to another. And if we've done that, then we've uh, accomplished sort of a pure transfer of information. So we can also quantify quantum information in terms of its transfer from one system to another in simple terms. OK, so my last slide uh, is just uh, returning to sort of big fundamental questions in physics. Uh, and in my mind, one of the biggest questions is how to reconcile this kind of picture where we have a fundamental quantum mechanical evolution. Uh, how do we reconcile that with gravity and local quantum field theory, in particular, given that there are black holes in nature? And one of the big puzzles is that ultimately you have to transfer information uh, apparently out of black holes as they evaporate. And the present laws of physics don't describe how that works. Uh, but quantum mechanics tells us that it has to happen. And so ultimately, it seems to me that this is telling us something very deep about the structure of quantum space-time, uh, so how space-time itself should be modified. And I'll stop there. Good, yes, I didn't give you one minute because you oh. said you were on your last slide. So we have okay. four minutes for discussion. You need more than four minutes if we go into this. <laughs> that can come later. So I, I, I guess the twiddles you have in front of local is very important. Because yes. what you're saying really is that it isn't local, really. It's just approximately local. Well, that, yes. That's the point. So that's the problem is yeah. local quantum field theory, you know, say in semi-classical space time, just doesn't describe yeah. what we need to happen apparently. Yeah. In order to save quantum mechanics. And so there's a non-locality. So, well, so it's not that, on field. the other hand, throwing out locality completely is crazy because you know if if well, locality is out, key. It's an approximation, right? Yeah, yeah. But so the question is, how do you get out something that is a you know, in this room behaves like local quantum field theory, but in certain circumstances apparently can't. Yeah. So again. Perhaps a similar question, but you, know, you say how to rescue quantum field theory, I'll say how to rescue classical relativity. No, no, I, I said how to rescue I'm quantum, quantum, I'm quantum mechanics. mechanics is what I meant, I'm yeah. sorry. And, and the second part. I'm sorry, so I'll, I'll say how do you rescue relativity. Well, yeah, my view on that is that uh, relativity, uh, which is described within the framework of classical space-time, ultimately is something that only comes out as an approximation. Classical space-time is only an approximation of some deeper structure. As a classical relativist, I'll disagree. What? That's fine. <laughs> so, but. So, uh, you started with uh, quantum information being um, very fundamental. So can you tell me in what sense you see quantum information as, as more fundamental than Rho? Or, or more the, fundamental the, than the density matrix? The, oh, well, the density matrix is a tool for describing quantum systems and, and quantum information uh, and their flow. So, so which is, is, is one more fundamental than the other, or they're equivalent? Uh, well, We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Saved by the bell. <laughs> Let me get uh, the ball rolling by saying nobody has mentioned the, uh, the magic word coding. That is, uh, information that might be in code might be meaningful or might uh, make a difference to a system that knows the code and can decode it. Genetic code being the obvious example, whereas to someone else it might be gobbledygook. So clearly we have to take that into account. Does anybody just want to, whilst the others are thinking of questions, does anybody want to take up that uh, issue? Well, I asked about quantum information or information quantically coded. I made it, I asked about it. Right, is that, is that quite the same thing as I'm referring to? So if you have the, the genetic code, there's a particular 
assignment of um, amino acids to triplets of, of nucleotides and nature has uh, determined for some reason we don't know, maybe just random, maybe uh, a result of evo evolutionary refinement, but there is a particular code. If you try to um, uh, feed that same nucleotide sequence into a system, a ribosome and some enzymes and things that had a different code, it would just be gobbledygook, it wouldn't do anything. And so the uh, existence of uh, coding is really important. The same information content but the, uh, whether or not the milieu that uh, interprets it has the key to the code is critical to what the outcome is, to whether the information is active, to use a term that David Bam introduced. So I'm just uh, hurling out ideas here. I didn't intend to dominate the discussion. I'm just the moderator. But yeah, did you just go ahead uh, with uh, comments? Yeah, a comment. Um, Carlo. I was, thank you. I, I was uh, uh, sort of impressed by just pointing out, this relates to what you're saying, that uh, in, in, in one way, I and mean, he's a philosopher, one way of uh, uh, thinking about information is that it needs a goal and a task. And that's great to you, because a code, uh, so, um, uh, uh, Olympia distinguished between the epistemic information and the physical information. It seems all these questions uh, touch one another. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the point I want to make is that uh, uh, somehow uh, mm, physics and the hard sciences evolved and uh, uh, started going much faster when uh, moving out from Aristotle's finalistic uh, and, um, uh, way of trying to understand physics. Uh, and uh, and uh, we do understand fin 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 finalism, I don't know how to say, in, 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 in biology by a Darwin evolution. So would it be possible to uh, bridge these two ways of viewing the epistemic um, by thinking that uh, uh, physical information uh, becomes uh, epistemic for a system who is evolving and who's, uh, who gets finalism from, uh, from, from Darwinism evolution. So in other words, uh, um, if, if, we think that, if we think as physicists for a moment, not just um, then uh, we have to reconstruct uh, finalism, and we have to reconstruct epistemic um, evolution, uh, uh, information from the physics. And Darwin gives us the way exactly for doing that. So a system that can survive and uh, that uh, uh, has is, is, is something that automatically uh, is capable of using physical information for the task of surviving, and therefore transforming into a uh, a task, a, uh, a, an objective, a goal, and into epistemic evolution. I, I, I realize that I'm speculating, but this is a Q Well, yeah, but, so. there's, but there's, there's an apparent paradox running through this, because, of course, Darwinism was an attempt to, uh, to describe living matter without resorting to teleology or finalism. Well, that's uh, right. Yeah, but, that's what I'm saying. But we know it's given rise to beings mm -hmm. like ourselves who do have goals. Uh, who clearly are purpose driven, and so somehow there's a contradiction at the heart of this that we haven't yet understood fully, I believe. Well, I, I would disagree with that, but maybe this is a different. I mean, that's exactly what Darwin tells us how to interpret uh, the finality, the intentionality which is present in us and we share with other living beings as a result of selection. I mean, the selection is select the, 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 the physical systems or subsystems. Uh, which are capable of elaborating information in such a way to keep themselves existing. And that might, right. be the, that might be the only bridge that I see. I mean, this is very vague, I realize it. But the, again, this is a good example. This is the only bridge I see between the epistemic and the physical information. I don't want to uh, dominate the conversation, because eh? I'm just a moderator. I'm supposed to be taking questions. <laughs> Um, so, so it's fair to say, just to follow up on this, it's fair to say they have uh, both physical systems and living systems, and making a separation between the two, which is not very obvious, have information. They encode information in different ways. However, living systems are able to use information in order to survive. Is that what you're trying to say? 
Exactly, that's what I was trying to say, and that Q's information is what a philosopher would call epistemic information, it's, it's meaningful information. The one channel did not want to look at. Well, if that's your distinction for living systems, then how would you describe a robot that was capable of using information in order to survive? From this point of view, it's a living system. I'm not trying to define a living system. It's just, yeah. Yes, so the statement is that quantum information is exactly conserved, which is really a, a quite extraordinary leap of, of, of faith or something else. And, and I, I'm wondering in particular, some of the other ideas that we have been hearing about, uh, like the multiverse, how does one simultaneously have a concept of uh, us being a small part of, of some multiverse, presumably most of which we... we we will never have any contact with and, and still have this idea of conservation of, of quantum information. Okay, so since I think I'm the one uh, being pointed at, uh, so maybe you should have started by objecting to my first statement that the world or the universe or the multiverse is governed by quantum mechanics. But if that's true, then one of the principles of quantum mechanics is unitary evolution. And if that's true, then unitary evolution conserves information. And that's just a basic feature of quantum mechanics. Now, sure, uh, we have some questions about how we apply quantum mechanics to the whole universe uh, or to the multiverse. Uh, some of us have given some thought about you know, what's the appropriate way of formulating quantum mechanics so you can do that. So that's, that's a starting <coughs> hypothesis. I think it's a good one to start with. Maybe there's uh, some alternative that needs to be explored. Okay, Don, uh, so to be fair to the right here. I'll be a little bit of devil's advocate. I mean, I, I, generally believe in, in I generally believe in unitary evolution, but let, something that just occurred to me. Suppose their time is just is not fundamental, so that you know there's just a quantum state of the universe, and there is an algebra of operators, and the quantum state gives expectation values to the operators. That's what I regard as the core of quantum mechanics then it's not clear to me that there's any evolution by which you can say anything is conserved. I mean, the whole state, of course, is some state, it's in the Heisenberg picture, and it could be a mixed state, could have any von Neumann entropy you want, but there's, may, maybe there's no way of slicing it than the hypersurfaces or something that has that. I'm, I'm being a bit of a advocate because I, I believe as far as black holes go that they, the black hole Hawking radiation doesn't lose information, although I should point out that Paul Davis, I think, is suspicious even of that. But even uh, if black uh, holes don't uh, lose it, I'm worried about in the multiverse whether you really can have, whether you can really slice it up in different ways and the information on each slice is conserved because maybe it's just the whole quantum state that has the, that, that has an information. Quick, yeah. quick comment from Steve. Well, so that's starting to touch on the question of how to formulate quantum mechanics for the universe or the multiverse. And yes, we may not have a, something like a space-time slicing. You know, there's an intermediate construction where you don't have, say, intermediate times, but you have something like an S-matrix, and you can ask if that's unitary. You just have an in-state and an out-state. That's a slightly less, uh, well, sharply defined uh, slicing involved in that. Okay. Um, I think we have time for only one more, so... Uh, I wanted to return to the, uh, into the discussion between the heuristic and the Shannon information. So I'm a neuroscientist, and it seems to me there's this very loose talk of the brain coding, whether it's the brain of a, of a biological creature or, or brain of a computer, but the Shannon and also the quantum information assumes there's a, there's a cha treats information as sent over a channel. And, my br and to the, the thing, if you look at brains, is that the, there's this intrinsic meaning that comes with the information, right? And so the Shannon sense of information isn't very useful, and we have to find a measure of, inf of information, and I think there are one, they haven't been discussed so far, that pertain to the, to, a, to the difference that makes a difference for the system in and of itself, because that's what the brain conveys. Right? When I look at you, you guys are actually meaningful symbols. Right? There's a whole lot of information associated with, with, uh, with uh, the perception I have of you. And if I look at individual neurons, it's not just that they transmit information between a photoreceptor and some higher center, because there isn't any higher center. Right? It's just all a chain of neurons. And so ultimately, the information has to arise intrinsically. And so that's where the, 
the, the epistemic comes from. But, it, but, but I think it's very dangerous to, to sort of to distinguish between living system and non-living system. We just need a different formulation of information theory that really pertains to information, to, to the difference that makes a difference for the system of itself and not across a channel where you have a receiver and you have a sender. Because there isn't a receiver in the brain and there isn't a sender in the brain. It's all a series of neurons that give ultimately rise to meaning. But, um, uh, no, Olivia, uh, sorry, Olivia, yeah. would like to make a quick comment. Yes, a comment be quick. Of, uh, to the question. You have a concept of semantic information, where information is something that has content, and this is a, a sense of information that is in the literature, and uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's interesting to see how you can uh, connect this sense of information with traditional discussions in philosophy <coughs> about meaning, about reference, about uh, representation. I think that this is a legitimate uh, question about information, the semantic view, but it's a different view. I try to. Yeah, but what we need is a calculus. We don't need, you know, philosophy. We need also the key calculus that the right man, that the system is in front of me whether it's biological or whether it, it was built by somebody or it evolved, doesn't matter. How much intrinsic information is there, is there, is there inside the system that makes a difference for the system itself? It's very, very hard to quantify semantic information. Uh, Bernard Olaf Coopers has uh, attempted. Uh, Joss, did you have a, a comment to make? One final comment then, and then we <coughs> must uh, move on. I think, I think what's missing in this case is that information is, is you know, um, depends on context. <clears throat> and I think that's that's very important, and that's not coming into this this at all. I'm I'm often reminded of <coughs> excuse me, Doc, Douglas Hofstadter's book Gerda Escher and Bach, and he gives a little a little story about the record and the record player. Um, how much information is on the record? Um, it's 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 useless unless you have a record player, and 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 um, you in some sense you you're dividing the information into what's on the record and what's on the record player. <coughs> kind of like, like, like coding Shakespeare is another example. I could very efficiently code Shakespeare by one bit, and, and, I'll, and I will give you, one bit means Romeo and Juliet, right? And then other bits will mean other, other works by other authors or Shakespeare himself. And so if we agree on this coding scheme, um, now I can send you one bit, and I've sent you all of, all of Romeo and Juliet. And so, so you, you somehow, somehow the, the, the <coughs> how the information is being is being carried by the record or, or your, your little USB drive is somehow being split among the, re the the device that reads it or interprets it in some sense and, and stores but it. But your time. There is no center for me and for my brain. You know, I'm a, I'm like a Leibniz Mona, right? So so I'm this conscious entity, right? And I'm not inside my brain. There isn't information being sent, right? The information somehow makes a difference. The fact that I look at you, I can identify you, I can infer certain things about you, who you are, and your gender and age, etc. You know, that has to be intrinsic to my brain. But if we talk to you, we're sending you information. Well, okay. yes, but ultimately it's perceived inside me or any other conscious creature, and so it ultimately we need something that. That defines information intrinsic to this system. Right. Well, Marcel, I can say something very quickly very quick, because we've got, so a, we've got a front as, as a physicist, the first step of this, there is something in information theory called the Kullback Leibler divergence, yeah. right? And you can define a base brain state and you can calculate deviations from that brain state internally to that brain. So that is one possible way of measuring something. Right. Final, final, final comment. Well, I'm okay. serious about this. Um, is this one? Yeah. I just wanted to go back to something that um, Carlos said earlier. He, he asked about the relation between epistemic and physical information. I wonder whether it makes sense to talk about physical information. Yeah. And w w or whether the epistemic view, is, is the, the notion really is the basic one. And um, when I think of Shannon information, um, I can give the impression that, that the Shannon information of a system is just a property of the system. But it starts with a set of, it, essentially a coding, a set of distingu distinguishable states, we, which you know, we are going to uh, regard as distinct things. And Shannon did have, was considering telephone lines or telegraph lines, you know, how, you know, how, how, how strong does it have to be to count as two, you know, how much is the distinction between the 
signal have to be because it's two distinct signals. And as um, Yost um, pointed out, Shannon information also has this probability distribution there. And the idea um, that Shannon had is, you know, how much information you get depends on how much you learn when you get a signal. If I tell you something that you already know, you get no information whatsoever. And um, what is often called Shannon information is actually information carrying capacity of a, of, of, of a channel. And I can either use it optimally and you know, transfer as much information as, um, as, as can be transmitted over that channel by telling you something you don't already know, or I can take the same physical system and transmit <coughs> no information whatsoever by telling you something you um, already do know. And I th so I think it's a mistake to think of information content as a property of a physical system. Information carrying capacity given a coding is a property of the physical system, but I don't think it makes sense to talk about the information in the system itself. Right, I'm going to truncate the discussion. You've raised uh, a lot of issues there. We're into murky waters. We'll be here for the rest of the morning if we pursue it. So please, could uh, we thank the panelists?